Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'd like to thank Charlie for uh, inviting me to give this talk. And um, there's already, already been talk about the uh, Nordics having an influence on Dubitron disease. Well, they may not be invading Europe with Vikings now, but their volcanic ash nearly stopped me from attending the meeting. And uh, I have to say that uh, historically it's very interesting when you look at the uh, uh, what's supposed to be the Nordic invasion of Northern Europe and pockets of uh, uh, areas within uh, sort of Northern Europe and the rest of the world where there is a high uh, prevalence of Dubitron disease, you find that uh, a majority of these places are um, areas of the world where there is a high population of uh, Northern European Caucasian descent. Now, here's a modern day uh, Viking warrior who's uh, thought to have uh, Dupuytren disease. And of course, uh, Ronald Reagan also had uh, Dupuytren disease. Now, it's very important to understand what are the elements to make a disease to be considered to be genetic. Of course, if there is a presence of the disease in twins, that's a no-brainer. Uh, if there is a familial tendency, which of course there is with Dupuytren disease, and whether this prevalence is amongst a particular ethnic variety, and if the disease severity is affected by that familial predisposition. So we looked at the family history and uh, an important concept in uh, understanding familial predisposition is the sibling recurrence risk ratio and showed that uh, when we compare the population in the UK to one in Iceland that of course this is a, a real phenomenon and, and therefore there's credence to it being a genetic disease. Now if you were to study a genetic disease, what are the genetic materials at our disposal? So we can take blood and look at DNA and RNA. We can take tissue and again you can look at RNA and DNA. And of course there are a variety of tissue types from a Dupuytren patient that you could look at. Now in terms of the genetic materials, um, for the tissue, you can look at the skin, we can look at the perinodule of fat, and we can look at the cord, the nodule itself, and of course the transverse arm fascia, which is not affected by Dupuytren. And external controls in individuals who don't have the disease, or who don't have the disease as yet, because as we know, this is a late onset disease, so any control patient can only go as far as determining that they don't have a family history and, pre and suppose that the patient is not going to develop to patrols. Of course, you can look at skin, fat, and fascia from those individuals. Historically, patients who are having carpal tunnel decompression have been looked at uh, for or have been utilized as a control. Of course, the other thing is very important when you look at papers that describe uh, signs of Dupuytren. Are they looking at early stage disease or are they looking at advanced stage disease? Are they looking at disease involving only the palm and or involving the digits? Now, this is very important because our understanding then is really based on a snapshot of disease. When this disease was removed from that individual, was it at an early stage? Was it, was it at an advanced stage? And is there such a thing? So, we have to understand all of these concepts before we can really make sense of what is available to us to, to look at. And it's interesting that a lot, of, a lot of studies have looked at genetic predisposition, and I will go into that in more detail. And gene expression studies will, which look at um, a pattern of genes expressed by the tissue, and you see a variety. Now, we need to understand that these, these varieties will also have to be uh, considered in conjunction with the phenotypes, because there are a variety of phenotypes. Now, this is not a new concept. The central dogma of any genetic research is that you have DNA, and then develop your mRNA, you produce the desired protein, and you have a biological function. However, 
when you have a potential polymorphism or a mutation, uh, this affects the level of your gene being expressed, you develop an abnormal protein, and you have an affected biological function. So, if we were to then look at what are these genetic uh, variations or uh, polymorphisms or mutations, what are the differences that we potentially look at? So the genetic variations can either be very rare, what we term as a mutation, or they can be 1% or more common, what we term as a polymorphism, and or they can be copy number variation, and this is a very new, important concept as emerging now. And what's termed as a CNV, and there are many, many of those, and there will be many publications to come which would have looked at this concept. Now, in terms of the susceptibility genes, we've already said this can either be a mutation, a polymorphism, a CNB, or a genetic rearrangement, and therefore that will affect the genes being produced and the level of gene expression and the protein. And we can look at those who are either doing gene expression studies, and here's a heat map which looks at the levels of the genes being expressed. And you are, if, you don't, if you do have a mutation and a problem, you develop this, but you can still have a mutation and not develop the disease. So, it's very important to understand not just the gene, but the environment. And there is a complex gene-environment interaction at play here. So to understand this, you can take the disease and go and find out what the variation was, or identify the variation and see if you can induce the disease. Unfortunately, we don't have an animal model as yet to clearly define this. Hopefully in the future there will be more suitable models to look at. So if we look at the history of all the studies done to date on genomic DNA in terms of the variations. We can look at genetic studies which have looked at family linkage and or large sample size case control association studies. Uh, we've certainly con conducted some of those and looked at polymorphisms. You can in addition look at mutation analysis. You can look at HLA typing and a region of the chromosome on chromosome 6 which is highly polymorphic and known to be associated with a number of uh, disease, immunogenetic diseases. Of course, you can look at um, cytogenetics and copy number variants. So what's been done in terms of uh, published evidence on family linkage? So a study was published uh, that looked at a Swedish family and um, this study showed that on chromosome 16, there was uh, a lot score of 3.18. Now, to have a significance of any genetic study in a family linkage, you really need a lot score of 3 and above. But even a lot score of 3 is not very high. And in this family, they showed um, this lot score, and on this particular chromosome, I did, well, they didn't actually carry on to identify the putative genes. Well, we did look at their findings, and we showed in a publication that there were a number of genes that were of, of interest. But the question arises, how significant is this gene in comparison to the other genes? Because there's only one family that's been looked at, and there's only one chromosome shown with a relatively modest blood score. So that's one of the problems associated with genetic research to do with Dupatrols to date. That's the only published uh, family linkage to date, and there have been a number of case control association studies which have looked at um, a, a number of cases and compared them to a number of cro cro um, controls with particular uh, candidate genes. Now, we published a number of these and identified uh, some interesting findings, and out of all the studies I carried out, uh, we, we showed an interest in a particular gene uh, ZF9, and a mutation in the mitochondria, and of course a susceptibility to HLA, which makes one wonder which is it that is more in, most important. And that really um, sort of, again, uh, here, uh, here's a table of, of the studies that we looked at, and we showed a lack of significance with quite a number of important candidates. Charlie was talking about the TGF beta, so we looked at this particular candidate to death. Really, we looked at its uh, different isoforms, looked at the receptors, looked at some of the SMADs, the downstream signaling molecules, and really didn't show very much. But showed some interest in other candidates, not particularly or directly related to TGF-beta. 
So other than case control studies, in terms of uh, association studies, we can also look at cytogenetics. And this work has been done before by a number of other groups. And there's really no need to replicate them, apart from the fact that trisomies of chromosome 8 and 7 have been shown. But these are not unique to Dubitrons, because they also occur in sarcomas and other uh, fibrotic tumors. And um, there is a table, table that we've put together of all these studies and a lot they've alluded to. And you find some interesting findings, but really nothing that sort of uh, alludes to the disease um, pathology. So in addition to the uh, cytogenetic studies, we can also look at copy number variations. And a uh, paper was published in 2008 uh, looking at copy number variations in Dubitron disease, but they didn't show any um, uh, statistically significant finding. Now what's very interesting is that this particular study used a um, particular chip that was available at the time, which only had so many genes available to it. Now, when we replicated this study, we used the latest gene chip available, which had about a million variants. And we've now managed to identify some findings. Who knows when the next chip comes along, what, what, what more can we found out? So this is a, uh, some of the data from this work, which is now published, in the, uh, should be online in JHS. And um, showed areas of interest on a number of chromosomes, and again, a uh, prelude to further investigation. So, so far we talked about um, linkage and case control, cytogenetics and, uh, and um, gene variations. What about gene expression when you look at the tissue and the studies that are done to date looking at that particular finding? So, we published a paper in JHS about, um, in 2008 and we took uh, Dupuytren tissue and divided it into module and called confirmed histologically and compared that to uh, fascia. And if, if, when you look at this, if you realize that um, the areas in red are um, uh, upregulation of a gene and the areas in green are downregulation, and each line represents a particular gene, you can clearly see here that um, there is a difference between the, the genes that are expressed in the nodule compared to the control. And of course, the nodule itself seems to be a powerhouse of genetic activity. Compare that to the, to the core, where there is very little happening there. Again, I'm making the relevance of understanding the phenotype when you're looking at genotype. So if you then take the, that data that we looked at and, and look at those particular genes, you can see a number of families that are of gene functions that are of significance. So we have cell proliferation, matrix deposition, cell organization, complementary behavior, and so forth. And if you look at those particular genes and look at those that are upregulated compared to, to which ones are downregulated, you see a puzzle emerges. And hence the interplay between uh, a number of genes and pathways in disease pathology. Again, we're looking at the number of genes uh, that were implicated in cord and fascia, which are very few compared to, the, uh, to what we looked at in, in terms of the nodule. And again, few genes that are upregulated, not surprisingly, collagen, non A, and uh, uh, HR protein. If you take all that data uh, and put it into this histogram here, and these bars uh, replicate the, um, the interaction between the, the different types of tissue in terms of the different phenotypes, the module, and then compare each one. So if you compare the module to the cord, and if you then you uh, to, to an external control, and if you compare the module to an internal control, uh, at areas of the, um, of the hand of the same individual not affected by Dupuytren disease, you get a very complex picture. But what is fascinating is that you get the most significant difference when you're comparing nodules and, and controls. <laughs> When you look at the variety of functions by these genes, you can then look clearly at the areas that are of significance and have been, uh, that need to be investigated. So in summary, gene expression, nodule is very interesting. And you need to look at a number of factors. Uh, I'm afraid it's not a very clear cut, straightforward story, uh, which makes it more of a challenge and, uh, and, and an interesting pursuit. But well, certainly all these uh, important functions need to be considered in relation to the gene pathways. 
So some of the ex examples of the gene expression data that we have here. Um, so here's a, a candidate, Adam12, and um, this is from uh, these gene expression work we did is based on the linkage study that was published uh, a few years ago that I alluded to before. And you can see differences in levels of gene expression when you're comparing fascia cord and module for each one of these genes. Um, interestingly, we not just looked at the uh, fascia and cord, but we also looked at uh, the fat and the skin adjacent to a nodule. And again, you can see a very different, different level of expression between fat obtained from a disease patient and that, uh, that obtained from a control. And we put all these data together, uh, looking at the different um, types and functions, such as cytokines and growth factors, and the extracellular matrix proteins, and then grouped all these in terms of the nodule, the core, and going back to uh, Locke's hypothesis of the different stages of disease as an additional tool to classify our findings a little bit more in, in terms of understanding uh, whether a particular function is more relevant to an early stage disease or a more advanced stage disease. Although a lot of these are based on our own clinical impression, we don't really quite have an objective way of assessing staging of diseases here. And I think that's one of the problems that we're facing with understanding the treatments. <coughs> so, you may turn around and say, so what? What's the importance of doing all this genetic research? How can you convince us that this is of interest and we should continue to do this work? Well, if we were to identify a susceptibility gene, I think this would be important in terms of possibly prevention, uh, in addition to diagnosis, and goal-directed or specific therapy. What about diagnosis? Well, you can characterize the molecular framework of the disease, and you can look at a difference between an important protein in the disease tissue compared to the control. Now, why is that important? Because you, can, you may deem appropriate what treatment to give at what point. So a patient harboring a particular uh, genotype in the tissue may not be suitable to treatment. Yes, we say that any particular, particularly for, I think for Dupitrozole, that's collagenase is available. It may be that collagenase may be more suitable for a particular tissue type at a particular stage of the disease. The question would remain at what stage? And that's something that we'd like to look at. How about treatment? So then you can test for these relevant mutations and give a different dose of the medication. The concept that's currently emerging in personalized medicine is the concept of theranosis, where you will adjust treatment on the basis of your diagnosis. If you go to a doctor and you've got an infection, you all get the same antibiotic, but some of you will respond and some of you will continue with that infection. Why is it that some of you are more susceptible and not all of you? And it will be the same with treating, treating disease. If we know the molecular framework, if we know the susceptibility gene, which has a direct interaction with the treatment, maybe that susceptibility testing will then um, give us more of a handle in terms of what treatment to give and at what point. Should we give a smaller dose of the treatment? Should we give a larger dose of the treatment? How many doses of collagenase would you give? Is one enough, two enough, three enough? Do you give it, you know, how many more months and so forth? These are the kind of um, utilities of genetic testing that may become quite relevant uh, as an adjunct to, uh, to treatment. So the proposed flowchart for management is nothing new. Most of you do this in your current practice. The most important thing is history, history, history. And in that history, you will be looking at a number of factors, including associated conditions, the diathesis, and relevant factors that may predispose to recurrence and or affect your choice of treatment for the patient. Of course, you're clinically examining. You have to make sure that you are dealing with a Dupuytron and not a differential. Uh, First of all, has already told us about the non-Dupuytron conditions. So therefore, um, you may get a, a referral letter from a physician saying, please treat this Dupuytron disease. And then you see the patient, and it's, of course, there is no Dupuytron disease, and it's something completely different. Or somebody that you need to do the uh, wait and watch and see what happens. 
of course, um, look at those factors. And then arrive at a diagnosis. Now, most of us use the Houston's table, tabletop test and evaluate the severity, either using a goniometer and or a number of other means. After the future, we would have this genetic assessment, a quick testing clinic, a buccal swab, a pinprick, and you will have a genetic test that may aid in your diagnosis and or aid your treatment more specifically. So maybe the volcanic ash, there may be some light at the end of the tunnel for a, a better understanding of tooth trial disease. I thought I'll end the, this talk by a, a little uh, reminder of where I'm from. We have a, a, a famous football club in Manchester, one or two actually, United and the City Football Club. This is the University of Manchester. I'm sorry, I'm just going back to this here. And um, the University of Manchester is one of the uh, largest universities in Europe. And we have a very big component on extracellular matrix work. But really, my research has not just been on genetics. We've been looking at a number of factors because I don't think this is a simple uh, condition to look at. And when you talk about genetic diseases, unlike many Mendelian uh, diseases, this is more of a complex disease which requires a number of approaches. And therefore, it all starts from the clinic. And it's important for a clinician to, involve, to be involved in science. And then you can look at the genetics, the role of putative cells, proteins, and then link all this back to a <coughs> clinic and treatment of patients. Um, I'd like to thank my group, people who have been involved in my lab. Uh, this is our building where most of the, uh, the genetic work is carried on. And, uh, and of course our clinical team, which has enabled me to do this research in South Manchester. And uh, acknowledge sponsors for funding of my research and of course collaborators. Thank you, let's make a difference.